Well, good evening, everyone. And on behalf of Melbourne IVF, I'd like to welcome you to this Facebook Live event where we shall attempt to answer all your questions you have about the IVF laboratory. My name is David Gardner, and I'm the Scientific Director of Melbourne IVF, and I've been working in embryology for 37 years now. And my name is John Stevens. I am the director of ART Laboratories, and I've been uh, working in IVF 25 years, not quite as long as David, but catching up to him. Catching up. <laughs> well, we've known each other all that time, at least. We have. We have actually known each other for 20, over 25 years now. <laughs> and John and I had the pleasure of working together in the US for a decade, um, where we ran America's leading IVF program, the Colorado Center for reproductive medicine. Um, and for the last three years, we've been the leadership team at Melbourne IVF's laboratory. So it's been a lot of fun working together again. It has been. So together, we were part of the, the pioneering team that introduced blastocyst culture and transfer to the world of IVF. You've probably heard the term blastocyst before. And uh, we were also the first to vitrify the human blastocyst and we pioneered single blastocyst transfer. So we thought what better way to start this than by showing you a video of the human embryo from fertilization up to the formation of this uh, blastocyst. John. Um, so hopefully you can all see this. You can see that, David? Yep, that's great, John. So uh, this will be a video taken um, from our embryo scope, uh, starting as an egg in this image. And at this point, we're 15 hours into um, the development. We can see that it is fertilized based on those two nuclei called pronuclei. So that's day one. Here we are 28 hours after insemination. We're getting close to day two. Ideally on day two, we'd be at this stage. This is a four cell embryo. Um, very good quality. Uh, this is day three. Uh, this is a very nice embryo, eight cells. And back in the 90s, when I first started this, this was about all we could do. We would uh, culture embryos to the day three stage, um, pick those to develop the best and do an embryo transfer. Uh, really wasn't until David Gardner came on the scene that we were even able to culture embryos past this point. He's the one who had developed the sequential embryo uh, culture media that would allow us to culture from day three to day four. And even on after that, this is where it should be on day four and is compacting. So, so what's really interesting at this point <clears throat> is that up to this point on day three, going into day four, you could see all of the cells of the embryo. And it's a bit like having sort of eight oranges in a, in a bag. You know, they're all, they're all free in that bag. And you can see around the embryo is like a, a cloud, and that's actually a, a membrane that holds the cells together. But around day four, something magic happens, and those cells flatten against each other, and hence the term compaction. They compact down and start uh, interdigitating inter with each other, in much the way that when you have a soccer ball and you look at the stitching on the ball, well, that's what they've done. They've stitched each other together. And now they can control inside and out. And what the embryo does next is something quite brilliant. It, it forms a cavity and it's called the blastocele and it goes on to expand. And it's at this stage, there are two cell types. The outer layer of the cells of the embryo is called uh, the trifectoderm, but all you need to know is those are the cells that are going to invade into the uterus and go on to form the placenta. And right in the middle of the embryo, you'll see a group of cells that keeps pretty much to itself and very creatively called the inner cell mass. And it's from that group of cells that the baby will form. And that's really where the magic happens. And what's gorgeous is now for the first time, we can watch all of these events in real times because in our microscopes, this time-lapse microscope, we can look at the embryo every 10 minutes. Where when John and I started out doing the blastocyst culture 25 years ago, we could look at the embryos maybe once a day, John, if we were lucky. Yep, once a day. And even then we 
hesitated because that meant taking them out of the incubator, exposing them to room air, change in temperature, change in pH. So we uh, tried to avoid taking them out of the incubator any more than we had to. That's right. So uh, the contrast is, is remarkable. The thing that we've been able to do is extract more information out of this because we're taking pictures every 10 minutes, we can determine when the embryo cleaves from one cell to two cells, from two cells to four, four to eight, when does that magical moment of compaction or the formation, what we know is an epithelium occur? And when does the embryo show the signs of having two different cell types? Um, and we can create what we call models or algorithms to help us um, predict which is a good quality embryo over a bad. And more recently, what we've been able to do is of course use um, artificial intelligence. But a, but a nice story that I like to share about the blastocyst is um, going back to uh, when we first started. And uh, John and I used to grow these embryos and we looked down the microscope and wonder what we'd actually grown. And we saw these beautiful structures and I would get very excited and say, John, that, that's beautiful. Or John, that's a gorgeous embryo. Mm -hmm. And after a few weeks, John said, you know what, David, we're going to have to do better than gorgeous and beautiful to describe these embryos. Mm -hmm. So I can't write that on our paperwork. <laughs> it just gave me hand cramps. That's right. So I, I took a whole load of still images we had on a thermal printer a camera attached to the microscope. And I, I went away and I laid them all down in front of me and I kind of came up with a, a grading system based on the size of the, the embryo and the differentiation of the two cell types. And that just became known as the Gardner grading system. And that was 20 odd years ago. And it's really humbling that that's actually then gone on to become kind of the world's system for grading the human embryo. So if you've heard of the Gardner grade, it all happened because John got tired of me saying, that's a beautiful embryo, we should do that. <laughs> and it, it is, I think, pretty uh, um, elegant, I guess is a good way to put it, up until the blastocyst stage. And, and what I was used to back in the 90s before David came along was a day three embryo where you could count exactly how many cells there were. We knew there were eight cells, we could see fragmentation, and it was easy to select the, the embryo that had eight cells over six cells. Yeah. Um, once we started culturing the embryos farther on, it, it, you couldn't count the number of cells. You couldn't look at an embryo and say, this is 84 cells or 58, you know, you had to come up with some other system to do that. Yeah, and, and the nice thing about the system that we created and used, it turned out to be very predictive. So uh, when we gave an embryo a high score based on our, our system, a grading system, it had a very high implantation rate. Um, and those we predicted would not be good, turned out to be not, not as good. So that, that was really good because we had two goals back in, and it still had the same goals, but really back 25 years ago, our driving force was to, to really get patients, more patients pregnant because the implantation rates were very low typically between 10 or 20 percent, um, maybe lower. With the blastocyst, we were able to double that overnight. That meant, you know, we were getting much higher pregnancy rates. The other thing is we want to get not just more patients pregnant, we want to get all our patients pregnant as quickly as possible. And that's where the grading system came in, because you want to be able to pick the best one out of a group to put back first to make sure that someone gets pregnant as, as quickly as possible. It's um, a little bit hard to describe. David, I, I didn't share this video with you earlier. I hope you don't mind putting you on the spot. But uh, <clears throat> as long as we're talking about grading, there it is. So this is the same kind of video that we were watching just a moment ago, except here you can see, well, 15 embryos. Um, and what we're we've been talking about in selection, getting the patient pregnant, trying to select that embryo, which most is most likely to get uh, them a baby, is if you think about it, here we are on day two in this particular case. And, you know, that's a nice embryo. That's a nice embryo. Really, 14 of these you know, could make babies at this point, at least as far as what we knew then, um, we wouldn't know which one to pick. 
except we wouldn't pick that one. Even here on day three, you know, this one's not developing, but one, two, three, four, five, five, six or seven of these are very nice embryos. And um, I think David and I would probably agree on which of these is the best, but not all scientists would, and we're not sure we'd be right. We can, once we could continue culturing them to uh, day five, it did become more distinct. So at this point, um, we're down to one, two, three, four, four or five embryos, six one that's um, gonna be frozen, but it does make it easier for me as a scientist to look at those and um, decide which embryo is most likely to implant. Other than selection though, uh, David had done the work, uh, the research to um, show that transferring a blastocyst in the, into the uterus really was a more appropriate time. Is that right, David? Is that what that, I remember? That's what's really it, it was the synchronization <clears throat> because prior to the, our ability to grow the embryo, we were putting back a four cell, eight cell embryo into the uterus um, at transfer, but actually the four cell and eight cell embryo live in the oviduct, the fallopian tube. And by growing the embryo to the blastocyst, that's exactly when the embryo would be in the uterus. We were able to synchronize the embryo and the uterus at the same time. And that, that's one of the reasons why uh, blastocyst transfer gave us higher pregnancy rates. Um, we do have a, a question here regarding the variables that are part of the, the Gardner rating. Mm -hmm. And while I've got these images up here, it might be a good time to uh, discuss that. Yeah, we can see some variables here. Um, you know, if we just start over with this one, uh, we're grading the size is the first part of the Gardner system. And it's on a scale one through six, a number which simply represents how large the embryo has become. So I don't have a good example of a three, but you'll see this embryo here is smaller. It, its diameter is smaller than this one or this one or this one. So we might call this a three be, simply because of its size. The second part of the Gardner system is a letter which represents the inner cell mass. That's the part that becomes the baby like David was talking about earlier. Um, real obvious in this embryo, that's the inner cell mass, and that's a nice, tight, compact group of cells. We would give that an A. Mm -hmm. um, this embryo here, um, those cells don't look quite as nice. We might say that's a B in terms of inner cell mass. Uh, I don't see one that's poor. This is probably a B because it's not very tight. The third part of the grade is the trophectoderm, or the part that'll become the placenta. So it's all these cells out here, uh, right underneath the shell. Yeah. Um, this, I would call an A for the trophectoderm. This is an A. This is more like a B, David? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, you know, so you put all that together, and we would call this one a 4BA, and this one would be a 4AA. So that would be the one you'd pick, John, the 4AA. So the 4AA is the one we want. Yeah. Um, this maybe wasn't the best example because this is a 4AA, this is a 4AA, this is a 4AA. Um, I, I'd lean towards this one down here. So, so you, you start to get a sense for one of the problems we've got is that <clears throat> John and I have been doing this for a long time and sometimes we still wouldn't agree. Um, really? You, uh, wouldn't pick, you wouldn't pick that one? Which one would you take, David? Oh, well, I think that there's a couple of beauties. Which one did you pick, John? Um, this one down here in I well be the window. Yeah, I don't, but I do like the one on the second in from the left on the top. That's, that's a bonny this one. This one here? Yeah, they're both nice. Yeah. So <clears throat> what we could do is we could rewind the tape now <clears throat> and we could look at how quickly the embryos got there. And typically, if they're faster, they're better. So that's one of the things we could look at, for example. Which one of them hits the four cell first, John, or things like that. <clears throat> now, 
But there's only so much information we can get because we're looking at discrete packages of information. So we have a question from Julie um, and she wants to know how does artificial intelligence work? So this is where, this is a question we can address now because we have all of this information. So we've got hundreds of images of the same embryo, <clears throat> but we're only looking at discrete times when embryos cleave. So what artificial intelligence does, it takes all the information from the video from start to finish. And we didn't tell it anything other than this particular embryo got, gave a pregnancy and this particular embryo didn't. What's the difference? So it started to look at all of these images and went through a, a process of uh, machine learning through neural networks to keep refining its decision-making tool to a point that after five days of refining itself, it was accurate to about 93% of the time. Um, on a good day, John, how good are we? Be nice. 85%. Thank you, I would say 85. So we've got AI is smarter than the two of us um, when it comes to picking the embryo. So in essence, AI can, can come in and, and John and I have got a considerable number of years doing this, but it means a junior embryologist, junior scientist can come in and ask the same question, which embryo to transfer and the computer's always gonna pick the same one. So it, it takes away that degree of subjectivity somewhat that, that mm. we have when we look at the embryos. I still think they're beautiful, but that's by the way. Yeah. I, uh... Beauty's in the eye of the, of the holder. And um, I can see one of the questions is, is there a grade that you would recommend not transferring? And there is, um, you know, based on implantation rate success you know, over the years, um, we've transferred, I think, every type of embryo that you could imagine. Yeah. Um, and we know that this is not going to make a baby. So, you know, that's an embryo that we wouldn't transfer. This one, we would let it grow a little bit longer, but it's not um, where it should be at this point at 109 hours. This embryo here, we would not transfer. This embryo, we wouldn't transfer. Um, and simply because our, our uh, success rates show that they don't implant. We don't want to transfer embryos that don't have a chance to implant. So, <clears throat> Subsequent generations of artificial intelligence have now been used um, and they've been trained on literally millions of embryo images, millions. And um, currently throughout the Virtus Network and at Melbourne IVF, we're, we're doing a prospective randomized trial where we're letting the computer have a go at taking us on in a prospective fashion, which is really exciting. So that's it's awesome. a challenge. It's, it's kind of challenge. like the... The, the famous chess matches of computer versus oh, the Russian guy, I forget his name. Yeah, um, yeah but I, I have no doubt that artificial intelligence is the way of the future. Okay. So one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that we do as well, of course, is we're very active in, in research as well as looking after our embryos. And one of the other trials that we have ongoing right now is on antioxidants. And this is a really interesting piece of work that we've been involved with for a number of years. And we've, um, we've got down to a group of three antioxidants, um, lipoic acid, acetylcarnosine, and acetylcysteine. And we've shown in animal models that they work together to promote embryo development in the laboratory. And we've done a pilot clinical study. And the really interesting thing is from this work is that we showed that uh, the antioxidants help patients over 35 years of age, which is the majority of our patients. And the rationale behind that is, is that as we get older, all of us get older, we acquire a cumulative oxidative damage. And that's from a lifetime exposure to pro-oxidants, breathing oxygen, all kinds of things. And uh, one of the hypotheses as to why the human female egg um, declines in quality over age is this, um, a mass damage over time. So that it makes the embryo more sensitive to its environment. So we've proposed that the antioxidants help protect the embryo when they're vulnerable, when they're older. And so to take that on, that's another large prospective randomized trial 
that we're currently undertaking. And we're just over halfway through and I can't tell you anything about the data to date. Um, we're not allowed to, I'm afraid. Um, but that's a really exciting trial that we have ongoing. I'm very proud that we can do these kinds of work for our patients. And honestly, David, I think that's one of the reasons why, at least for me, embryology has been a career. It's always changing and being part of a clinic that is always on the leading edge is very rewarding. It's, it's great to be you know, forging the new frontier, so to speak. Yeah, it, it's a tremendously exciting and rewarding occupation, I have to agree, totally, yes, it is. Um, we have a question from Jody. Does IV take into consideration uterine conditions and how much impact does the uterine environment have on the overall pregnancy success rate? Um, so really two points there, and um, there really isn't a way for IV to take into consideration the, the uterus. Um, you know, that's part of the success rates, um, which the clinician really is responsible for. Uh, and, and each clinician is trying to optimize the, the patient, get that uterine environment as good as it can be to receive the embryo. We can do what, uh, as much as we can to create um, high quality embryos, select the ones for transfer. But if that embryo is transferred into a, a uterus that's not ready, it won't implant. Um, so I can't take that into consideration. Um, David's done quite a bit of research on the uterine environment and pregnancy success rate. So I, I imagine he could answer that better than most. It's, it's, uh, it's a great question. It's a really good question. I mean, and <clears throat> we have to admit that for most years, there's not a lot of research been done on the endometrium compared to the embryo. So the lining of the uterus, the endometrium obviously needs to be in, in good shape. So a nice analogy is the blastocyst or the embryo is the seed and the uh, endometrium is the soil. And obviously you need to have fertilized the soil, you need a good soil. So a lot of that can be done working with optimizing uh, the protocols that the physicians use. Um, so the, the uterine environment does have a, an effect, but mostly when it's a hostile environment, um, then it can have a, a very dramatic effect. Um, but the embryo is, it's not just one. I mean, the embryo and the endometrium actually have this conversation, which is fascinating. They talk to each other. So I guess the short answer is they're both important um, in the outcome. So um, I've got a question here from Kim. A uh, very good question is, why is the antioxidant trial only on fresh embryo transfers and not frozen? That's a very good question, uh, considering that we've just published a paper that shows in animal models, antioxidants are beneficial in frozen embryo transfer that will be one of our next trials that we'd like to do. So, um, yeah. One, one step at a time. I'm afraid we can, we can only do one step at a time, yeah. Um, another question from Nitin, I believe, is 5AA a good graded blastocyst? And yes, yeah, that, that's our, uh, uh, that's what we strive for. If we could transfer <laughs> a 5AA every time, yeah. we'd be very happy. We would. Uh, a 5AA would be even a little bit more advanced than some of the embryos we've been seeing. Our, a 5 is beginning to hatch out of its shell. Yeah. And that's something the embryo has to do in order to implant. Uh, more often than not, it's hatching once it's inside the woman's uterus. But we do sometimes see that in the laboratory as well. Um, another question from Kim. Are younger women more likely to have embryos or higher quantity of embryos of a better grade? Um, yes, it, it's not a, a, a steadfast rule, but in general, we do see um, more eggs from women who are younger, uh, simply because they can be stimulated to produce more eggs. Uh, more, more often than not, uh, their embryo their embryos will develop into better blastocysts, or at least a higher percentage of them yeah. than an older woman. Yeah. Um, but it's not black and white. No. But, but what is interesting is, as um, 
women age, you know, the incidence of aneuploidy of chromosomal abnormalities in their embryos increases, certainly once you get sort of in your late 30s into your 40s. Um, but actually those embryos are the, that have a better morphology, so a higher grade, are actually less likely to be aneuploid than uh, a poorer quality embryo. So that's an interesting observation several people around the world have, have been able to, to uh, report. Um, Jessica has a question. When a thawed embryo transfer is performed, how do scientists choose which one to defrost? Um, that is a great question. And it's, we're, we're doing more and more frozen embryo transfers. That's become a, um, a big part of what we do. And vitrification in particular uh, has allowed us to do that. We're, we're, we see pretty much equal results or equal pregnancy rates when we're tra transferring frozen embryos as compared with fresh. Um, and to choose the embryo for transfer, we're really doing the same thing that we do for a fresh embryo. Um, all the grades of the embryos have been recorded. The uh, embryos are frozen individually so that we know embryo number three, when it was frozen, was a grade 4AA, and embryo number four was a 3BB. So when it comes time to thaw, we're gonna thaw embryo number, what did I say, four? The one that's a 4AA is the one we're gonna thaw for transfer. Um, with artificial intelligence, we also have uh, that input. So each embryo has a, a grade or a, a score given to it by the artificial intelligence. And again, we um, triage the embryos or we document a transfer order. This is the best quality, highest AI score, and so on and so forth. Which kind of answers a question from Maria, who asked, when there's multiple embryos, do you implant the better ones first? And I think you just answered that question, John, very nicely. Yep. So, so out of a group of embryos, as you can see from John's video, you know, we can able to rank them in terms of scores. And that's exactly what we do. That's the batting order, as it were. They, they go in from the top and then we work our way down. And... You know, earlier somebody had asked, is there an embryo that you wouldn't transfer? And, you know, we had said yes. If I can just share this again. Oops, there we go. Again, looking at this picture here, David and I agreed that this one uh, would, well, number two would be the first embryo for transfer. These other embryos are going to get frozen, and we would transfer probably this one next, and then this one, and then this one. Um, on down the line would be this one. Any of these that were, um, well, any of these except for this one and probably this one uh, could implant. It's a matter of the chance that it's going to implant. This one has the highest chance of implanting. This one has a lower chance of implanting. Um, this one has no chance of implanting. This, ha this one has some chance, but you know, it's so um, there's really a hierarchy. It's a matter of implantation rates. It's not yes or no, it's maybe. Okay. Um, this is a, a good question from Jessica. Uh, does transferring two embryos increase the chance? So um, we take a step back, putting more than one embryo back is, is definitely not a good idea. Um, although I'm sure as, as patients who want to conceive a family, having twins seems like a great idea. You have, have it all in one go, but actually there's always a risk when you have a multiple pregnancy, twins or triplets, and, and that the more uh, fetuses in utero, the, the greater the risk, not only to you as the mother, but also to the children. So we like to say you can have as many embryos as you like back, but you're gonna have them one at a time. And we can say that with confidence because our vitrification, our ability to cryopreserve the other embryos means that their viability is not compromised at all. So our pregnancy rates are equivalent, right, John, between the fresh and the frozen. So we're not harming those embryos because our technology has advanced so much that those embryos are safe in the liquid nitrogen. So what we try to do is to select the best one and get you pregnant as quick as we can and then you can come back and have its twin, but you can do it next year. Yeah. 
Um, Emma asked a question about uh, antioxidant, David. That looks like um, something you could speak to. Okay, uh, but how much evidence is there to support your antioxidant trial on humans? Okay, so yes, it was a human clinical trial we did overseas. We did a, a pilot study in Japan. Um, <clears throat> and it was from that that we saw that the antioxidants were safe and that in an aging population, I think it was 35 and above, uh, there, was a, there was a significant benefit. There were more babies born from that group, um, which was really exciting. And it looked like we'd <clears throat> help delay the decline in fertility in those older patients. So that's what happened. Um, Yasmin has a question about uh, which embryo is better for transfer, a, a 5BA embryo compared with a 4AA embryo. Um, both of those are very good embryos. Yeah. And uh, as we sort of alluded to earlier, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Um, without looking at those side by side, it'd be difficult to say this one's gonna have a better chance or not. And the reality is they're probably pretty equivalent. If we had to make a choice with uh, that information, it'd be the 4AA Every is when I would transfer. Yeah. Um, ideally, we'd go back and look at the video and ask yeah. artificial yeah. intelligence to give us some help. Okay. Um, Siva uh, has a question, can the doctor optimize the uterine environment so it is better suited for a day five, six or seven embryo? Thoughts, David? Well, the docs try to sync the uterus to the embryo, yeah. So <clears throat> um, they will certainly take that into account. Um, they'll also take into account the lining of the uterus to make sure that it's thick enough, it's progressed enough to be uh, sufficiently soil-like to receive the seed, as it were. So mm -hmm. they will take those things into account. Um, when freezing eggs for a later date, does this affect the outcome compared to using fresh? Very good. It is good. That, that's a very good question. Um, invasive procedures. So freezing eggs, just like freezing embryos, is not 100%. We um, know that 85, 90% of the eggs we freeze survive. So there is that negative. You freeze your eggs, and if you have 10 frozen, nine will survive. Whereas if you do a fresh cycle, um, you've got 10 eggs instead of running the risk that one, one won't survive. Once they're thawed, um, we do see pretty much the same success rates. Uh, once they're thawed, thawed and survive, we see the same fertilization, same development, same pregnancy rates. So the, the biggest risk is that not 100% of the eggs will survive. Yeah. Uh, Kim asks, is embryo banking permitted at Melbourne IVF? Can you have multiple stem cycles to create embryos before trying to implant them? Yes, uh, that's not an unusual practice. Um, you know, that the, the strategy is often left up to the clinician and the patient, they would talk to, um, they would talk to each other about what is best for that patient. But it's uh, a woman who's say 40 and wants to have two children may choose to bank multiple embryos while she's a 40 year old, then transferring one at age 40 and then trying to create more embryos when she's 43 or something like that. So yes, is the, the short answer. Okay. All right. Well, I hope we've been able to answer most of your questions. Um, it's been a lot of fun showing you our side of the lab, as it were. Um, if you have any further questions, please check out the web page and uh, you'll find us both there. John? Thank you very much for joining us. Like David said, it's been fun. It's, uh, it's always nice to remember the old days when <laughs> we used to transfer on day three. <laughs> And it's kind of nice to also consider where we're going with the future at the same right. time. So it's, uh, it, it, it's an exciting um, time, I think. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And it's just on our ongoing commitment to you, the patients, uh, to try and ensure that more patients get pregnant and we get you pregnant as quick as we can. So right. thank you. Thank you all. Good evening. Have a good night. Okay. Bye-bye.